Welcome back to The Transfer Show, brought to you by Sky Mobile, the show where we discuss and debate the latest goings on, the latest deals, the latest rumours in the transfer window. Today, we're going to be having a look at all the action from the last week and also discussing Liverpool's plans ahead of the new season. Very exciting stuff. I'm joined today once again by Dharma Chef. How are you doing? Very, very good. Nearly good over. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that, yeah. Really. yeah. yeah. How, long is it, how long is it until the end of the transfer window now? About two and a half? Three weeks. Three weeks. Okay, cool. Have you got a holiday plan for uh, Very for much so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not booked it yet. Fair enough. <laughs> and I'm also joined to chat all things Liverpool mm. and more, Lawrence McKenna. Mm. Welcome to the show. Thanks. It's exciting times to be on, really. Yeah, it is as Liverpool. well. It does, it does feel like good timing, doesn't it, this mm. week from a Liverpool perspective. We'll be on to Liverpool very, very shortly. Let's start, though, uh, with Man United situation this week. Darmesh, because they're still looking for a defensive midfielder. Manuel Agate mm. seems to be their first choice, but you know differences in valuation on that front with PSG, who have brought in Joao Neves. Yusuf Fofana has come up this week among some other names. What can you tell us about what's going on there? Just generally with the midfield area, it, it's clear that United want to strengthen in that area. Um, we talked about Uate. I'll mention what the exact situation is with him in a moment but with Yusuf Fofana the dialogue I'm told is open between United and Monaco about a potential deal. Monaco will probably want to do some business if they're not going to tie him down to a new contract because he's entered the final year of his deal and it just has that feeling that there is a deal there to be struck if someone can come up with Monaco's valuation of Yusuf Fofana. So United definitely looking at Fofana, one of a number of players that they're looking at. They've also turned their attentions to Burnley. Yeah. And Sander Berger, which has been a, quite a left field one, but an interesting one as well. So they've held initial talks with Burnley over the conditions of a deal that it would take for Berger potentially to go to Old Trafford. Um, we think that Berger would welcome the move. I know that sounds pretty obvious, but going from the Championship to the Premier League and maybe to Manchester United. Personal terms aren't expected to be a problem in that situation. So those two seem quite live at the moment. There are other options that United are looking at as well. We mentioned Manuel Uarte. They still retain an interest in him. However, not at the prices being quoted. A problem that PSG have got is from the outset of the window, when they decided they were going to go for Joao Neves and wanted to sell Manuel Uarte, they wanted to make a profit on Uarte from what they paid Sporting Lisbon last summer, which was in excess of 50 million. Mm. Now, that's all well and good. If you're not, if you haven't brought anyone in, but there's a certain degree of pressure now on them potentially now that Joao Neves has come because he's going to start. They're not going to pay fifty million pounds for Joao Neves and not play him. So Uarte, whose game time was kind of limited last season, is going to be further limited this time. I think United will go back to the table if there's a sign that they're willing to negotiate on their asking price. So. That's the Uate situation. They're also looking at Palmeiras's Richard Rios and Sofian Amrabat as well. That name won't go away. Even though they had him on loan with an option, they didn't take up the option. They want to negotiate on that option price of 20 million euros. So that can't be ruled out either. It would be less problematic to do any kind of incoming if they can release one of their players. Because from the outset of this window, it looked like a one-in-one-out situation at United. I'm not saying that that's going to be set in stone because there might be a deal that they just simply can't turn down even if certain players remain at the club and the two that I'm talking about Casemiro and Scott McTominay we know that there was Saudi interest in Casemiro that's cooled down looks like he's staying at the moment Fulham strongly in for McTominay two bids both rejected big gap in valuation as it stands they're not going to go back but that could also be a tactic they're looking at other options but then a club is going to do that and would want to make that public because is there a chance the further down the window you go that Man United might reduce that price? So, yeah, not much going on. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of moving parts as always yeah. at United, especially this summer with PSR concerns. I mean, I had, yeah, I had a few questions here in terms of, yeah, what's the latest on McTominay? You've covered that. I mean, with Agate as well, it feels like, yeah, does it does it feel like then now that PSG have made that move for Joao Neves mm. that perhaps United feel they could be in a more strong negotiating position? Do you feel like is there a feeling at United that they need to get a midfielder in for the start of the season for the opening day 
Look, or, in an or ideal, do you think there'll yeah, be a patience there? In an ideal scenario, every club wants to have everything done before the season starts. That's clear. But it very, very rarely happens because these deals, there's so many complexities associated with certain deals that it's very difficult to get all of the players that you want before the season starts. And then once the season starts, there could be an injury, a bad injury, and then that could change plans in certain positions as well. It's clear the player wants to go. Uate wants to go. He knows he's not going to be getting much football at PSG. This was even before Neves, uh, Joao Neves came. So that wasn't the issue. Now he is there. Yeah. He's not going to play, if at all. So that, in its own way, brings its pressure to, to PSG. And maybe we know how clubs would work. If you're in that position where you're interested in a player, why go straight in for their asking price when you can detect, hold on, this price might come down only because you've got a situation here and we know the situation you've got. You don't want both players at the club. Yes, you could say, oh, Wato will be a great uh, backup to Neves, but really? Yeah. Are you really going to do that? It's very difficult. Yeah, especially if the player's pushing for a move as well. If, you know, Agate feels like he's not going to get much game time. Um, Lawrence, let's come to you now because... You know, as, as, as United, you know, still try and work this out with their midfield, Liverpool, who were pretty quiet up until the last week. It's a great understanding. Um, you know, suddenly seem to be coming in with a lot. Of course, David Ornstein uh, revealing earlier this week that there was a mystery number six who Liverpool were looking at. That's now been revealed to be uh, Zuba Mendy mm -hmm. out of Real Sociedad. That move looks to have picked up a lot of pace now. I mean... Um, yeah, what, what do you make of, of these reports? Are you excited? I mean, I'm certainly excited to see any... I think any, any fan, any, anyone who supports any club would be excited seeing new signing coming in, especially with a new coach. I think what's interesting about Liverpool is, you know, we remember the Michael Edwards years that went before, and now we're seeing the Michael Edwards and Richard Hughes years, and there's almost a rollout of a transfer now from Liverpool. Other clubs are kind of scrambling around trying to get Bogarte in or whoever, and it's like, oh, will it happen, won't it happen? We heard... 48 hours before, now it's 24 hours before, and within 24 hours, Liverpool have potentially signed a player who, at one point, told clubs, oh, I, I want to be a Real Sociedad player for as long as I can be. So, there is an impressive nature to what is going on, and, you know, Liverpool had a great summer that has set up this summer under Klopp and Pep Lingers. This is now even more efficient. And what's funny about it is, I think a lot of people watched Liverpool's three pre-season games and thought, where is the weakness that we would improve? Mm. And the nuance of being able to identify Zubamendi and say he's going to knit all of this together, that makes Liverpool fans extremely excited. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you say that in pre-season, you know, Arnold Slot using three different players in the number six role, not including Alexis McAllister. Mm -hmm. All um, of which, by so the way, did a great job. Yeah. Like, they all did a pretty decent job. Which you could, say, uh, you could say last season as well, with McAllister and Endo kind of deputising there. But even sure. last season, it felt like the number six position in you know in the wake of Fabinho leaving was one of Liverpool's weak points, especially with Basatich, you know, not unable to develop due to his his injury as well. Um, what is it about Zubamendi uh, that that this Liverpool team is missing? Would you say? I think immediately it didn't jump out to a lot of Liverpool fans. A lot of people were a little bit underwhelmed by being uh, connected with him, mainly because they thought we need a destroyer. But most people were going off the previous. Clock model of, oh, well, you sit this guy there and this goes here and this mm. goes here. Zubamendi is much more of the, I'm going to stand, make a tackle, get the ball away from you, and maybe someone else will pick it up and get away with it. And if they don't, I'm going to run, or I've got a very efficient, quick way of getting the ball out from under my feet. That works really well for Slot. He wants control. The word control comes up in almost every interview that he's done. And I think what's great about this Liverpool team now is, with their changing identity, it's making them really hard to predict. So in the new season, a lot of managers are going to be looking at him and saying, well, Where's this guy going to play? How are they going to play here? And it's going to start Liverpool and stand Liverpool in a really good step for the season. Um, on top of that, I think what Zubamendi brings is defence that can very quickly turn into attack. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, if Xabi Alonso endorses him, which apparently he has, then he's good enough for Liverpool. Nice. Well, of course, he worked with him in the Sociedad B team as Absolutely, well, didn't yeah. he? I guess it'll be interesting to see how you know, how he works, you know, not alongside Mikel Marino, who, you know, Absolutely. was his kind of partner in crime for so many years at Sociedad. You know, the idea of both of them coming to the Premier League, if they do, um, it is really, really exciting. I mean, mm. this could be a transfer that, for all we know, could even be done by the time you guys are watching this 
at home. Um, but yeah, let's move on uh, to our next story. Um, Jaden Sancho, we're kind of going back to Man United here, um, to PSG, Darmesh. I mean, we spoke about Agate before. I mean, is there any possibility, you know, you speak about outgoings at United, is there any possibility, we heard about it a couple of weeks ago, could, could this also be used as some sort of make weight in a deal for Agate, or could there be any negotiation? I mean, here? when you talk about swap deals, yeah. they, I don't think they're strictly swap deals like mm. we, you, we're used to, that they've happened in the past, that one player goes one way, one goes the other. It's so much more complex than that, mm. and there are financial details that are involved in certain deals where you can't just say there's a swap, there's a swap, there's, there isn't the account. It's got to be put in the account via numbers. So strictly speaking, it won't actually be a swap. But when you're talking about will it ease it, of course, if you're in negotiations with a club, by definition, yes, you're talking to them. So that can help another deal along. We're talking about United talking to Bayern Munich about Masraoui. No one's telling me they're not talking about De Ligt at the same time. Of mm. course they are. They're going to be talking about these players. But these players will have their own values. So for it to be just a simple swap deal, United won't simply think, right, we can offer Sancho and then just make up the rest of the money that um, PSG would have wanted in their asking price because that would still be meeting PSG's asking price, which they don't want to do strictly. They want to bring down PSG's asking price. By the same token, PSG want to bring down Manchester United's asking price on Jadon Sancho. With Sancho, I mean, the situation is very interesting because everything got... A line was drawn under all the issues between Eric Ten Hag and Jadon Sancho. He was reintegrated in the first team. He went on the tour. By all accounts, he trained really well. And he reintegrated himself with everything to do with United's first team. That hasn't stopped clubs who are interested in Jadon Sancho remaining interested. Just because they've seen that, they've not just thought, oh, right, he's fine there now. He's not going to go anywhere. That's not the case. Because if they do get a suitable offer, then I'm not saying United are definitely going to sell Jadon Sancho. But it is one of, one of these situations where they'll have a look at it. It's not going to be completely dismissed out of hand. They will think, let's see what this offer is. Let's see who we've got in the squad anyway. I think it's been sort of altered slightly because Eric Ten Hag has been speaking about Jadon Sancho maybe playing in the false nine mm. role. But that smacks of short-term yeah. planning rather than anything else. So United fans might ask, oh, because he says he's going to play in the false nine, that means he's not going to go because... He's got to play at the beginning of the season. Sometimes United have thought too short term in the past. They're not doing that anymore. They're trying not to do that anymore. So if they need Jadon Sancho, for example, at the beginning of the season, and yet they get a deal that they can't refuse, I don't think that that short term is going to be something that they'll look at and think, oh, we'll have to keep him because we need him for these first two or three games. By that time, the window's closed. Are they going to get a deal like that again? Yeah. So it's not going to be, I don't think it's viewed as injuries playing a part or Joshua Zerkze trying to um, get up to speed. That In that way, that's not going to dictate if a player gets sold or not. That's that's what I think uh, is, is is the situation. Yeah, I, th I think I think you raise a fair point there. I think the, the kind of long-term thinking at United, that, that does seem to be more of a thing now under the new ownership, doesn't it? And I think... You know, the, the, given the money that was spent on Zerkze as well, you expect mm. that even if he does take a bit of time to come up to speed, that is kind of his position, isn't it? I mean, and, and there are, you know, there are there are options there in in the United forward line, I guess. And we've even seen Bruno Fernandes used as a false nine by Eric Ten Hag in the past as well. Lawrence, I guess mm. on the subject of Sancho, um, you know, he, he's a player who's kind of had a, uh, almost an unfair amount of scrutiny mm -hmm. on him since that United move and, you know, what happened with Eric Ten Hag and, you know, kind of dropping out of the England picture as well. Do you feel like even after having made up with Ten Hag at United that he needs to leave the club to kind of fully kind of realise his potential again? Because we saw how good he was at Dortmund, didn't we, on loan last season? Yeah, um, I guess a change is as good as a rest sometimes for some of these players. And I, I think being away from United definitely helped his mental situation as much as it helped Manchester United rejig things. The fact that he's caught up 
in what was quite a messy structure before and some of the fallout possibly some of the anger that was actually towards Manchester United's hierarchy has been transferred onto him hasn't helped the pressure that's been put on him and I think that was a little bit unfair in that period to move to PSG definitely takes you out of the limelight and the spotlight that the English media put on you and puts you in a slightly better environment to thrive should we say PSG are also geared up and set up for someone like him to thrive in the playing position, but also with the players around him. They're looking for someone who can almost play in exactly that position. Could get Because guess what? One of their <laughs> big talismanic players left this summer and they need someone else who can come in. And I don't think he's never going to put up numbers that, that Mbappe put up. No. But you have to make up Mbappe numbers in the aggregate. And I think a lot of people are overlooking that now in the Premier League as managers and clubs look more towards systems and ideas and it doesn't matter really who's in those systems and those ideas as long as they can fulfil the role. Players on these massive levels aren't going to have those same impact with the personal situation they have anymore. And that's why I think Liverpool, Arsenal, Manchester City and all the other clubs are slightly ahead of Manchester United at this point. United are going to have to go through this difficult, painful mm. period mm. where it is, frankly, a bit messy. But that's the whole point of supporters, isn't it? You're supposed yeah. to support when it's not as good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It, it does feel like that, doesn't it? it especially in terms of, you know, the, the, the main kind of... You know, the likes of Dan Ashworth getting in quite you know, later than Ineos would have liked. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah, it, it does feel like it's, you know, it, maybe we, United have to wait, you know, until next summer mm -hmm. before United really have everything in order. I guess from it's a good. Liverpool perspective, <laughs> from a Liverpool perspective, Lawrence, that, that, do, do you feel quite, you know, I feel like race for top four this year is going to be incredibly competitive. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like United where they are right now even if they were to get you know a couple of other targets in before the end of the window would you say from a Liverpool perspective especially given the news this week you're relatively unworried by the, the thought of Ten Hag's United coming back? No I think in the same way as United now are always worried about Liverpool Liverpool are always worried about United's mm. resurgence and I know how quickly these things change at a club especially you know Jurgen Klopp coming in all those years ago the club changed within a couple of months I know that we they didn't get straight back into the Champions League but it was certainly you know, it was really positive. You also know the differences that just Eric Ten Hag and smart coaching can have on a side. Let's let's be honest. Like he's going into this season weaker than he left last season, but he still is a good coach. And there's a reason that they kept him. And there's a reason that he warrants being in this position. It was because they couldn't find a better candidate for a, for in a better situation than him, or they have something up their sleeve <laughs> further down the line. I don't know what that is. I don't know if they even do have that. But the point is that Manchester United are moving in the right direction. So, who knows? Like, I think the other signings they've made in Lenny Oro, Xerxes and whoever else uh, should come in in this period is laying the foundation for big signings after that and potentially building something which is a long-term vision. And that is what worries me most. Yeah, fair enough. I guess coming back to Liverpool as well, it's not only Zuba Mendy who's, you know, the, the club are targeting and, and, you know, could have could have got a deal by the time you're watching this. Mm. Uh, we saw uh, Pierre Hincapié as yep. well linked this week out of Leverkusen. Again, another player with a Xabi Alonso connection. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I guess, first of all, what are your thoughts on that? And off the back of the Zuba Mendy news, is there, is there anything else that you think is imperative in terms of an area of the team that Liverpool need to address before the season or it's, before the end of the window, at least? Well, it's difficult because there's a big a bit of cognitive dissonance, I think, in the Liverpool fan base at the moment. We... We have a set of players that we love and have loved for a long time at Liverpool and it's difficult to let go of those guys. But at the same time, and I, you know, I've said this multiple times now, we haven't actually had backup for Virgil van Dijk for quite some time at Liverpool and they've been very lucky that he hasn't had that, any serious injury since his last serious injury. So having someone come in who can back him up or having someone come in who you know, will be a successor of sorts is a real priority for Liverpool. But the same goes for Andy Robertson. I think people forget. Andy Robertson plays a really rough game. He's one of Liverpool's enforcers. And that's not to be overlooked. When, uh, especially when Jurgen Klopp first came in, Liverpool lacked enforcers and people were really scared of out on the field. Now, there are plenty of people that you know, if you put in a tackle on Zubamendi or one of those guys, two seconds later, there's going to be studs raked down the back of your leg and you're going to be in trouble yourself. Robertson's one of those, Virgil van Dijk's one of those enforcers. So let's, like, let's look at targets who are going to be crunchers, people who are going to go out there and make Liverpool a scary force. It's not just about the system. 
So Hinkepe is a perfect example of that. Yeah, incredibly aggressive defender, isn't he? I guess, uh, you know, would, would ideally, you know, we saw the news about Mark Gehi this week and, mm -hmm. and Newcastle going in big for him. Would he have been otherwise someone who you would have really liked in that Liverpool team? I think it's always good to have someone uh, who fulfills quotas in terms of mm -hmm. nationality for any side. I have absolute faith in the Liverpool Transfer Committee, mm -hmm. uh, which is a phrase that 10 years ago, a lot of fans probably wouldn't have said. Mm -hmm. Now, move slow, move quick. I don't think anyone really knows what's going on at Liverpool until, until it's actually happening. And that's one of the most satisfying things, I think, as a fan, because it means that I can watch any videos and just laugh along with, oh, that's, that's a lovely rumour you've got there. Um, it, it makes a big difference to a fan base when they trust the people who are bringing players in and they know that there is a symbiosis almost between the people signing and the people coaching those players. We've just watched him coach a team that was essentially another manager's team and now he's bringing in these little change pieces. There's nothing better than that for Liverpool fans. Yeah, and I guess it just underlines just how important it was that FSG got Michael Edwards back in, 100%. got Richard Hughes in, who had such a good record. Um, at Bournemouth. Mm -hmm. Very quickly before we move on to our last story, could you see another unlikely title challenge this year from Liverpool or are you very much just focused on getting top four again? Why rule it out? I love that Liverpool worry other teams and for some weird reason, even when we're not as confident, other yeah. teams are more confident in us having the title charge. There's no reason why, I mean, uh, we've not even seen Liverpool kick a competitive ball yet. So mm -hmm. There's no reason why we should rule it out, especially considering that I think what burned Liverpool out last year was the intensity of what Klopp was doing, the emotional intensity. By all accounts, there were multiple players, young players, who felt very upset about the way that it all ended. Not that it was incredibly traumatic, just that an era was over mm. at Liverpool and they didn't sure. know what was going to happen next. So why not, you know? Especially considering the good feeling that's around the club at the moment. Bald people are all in in football right now. <laughs> that's all that you need to know. <laughs> Well, I certainly. Agree. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, yeah, Ten Hag slot uh, derby next year is going to be really, really fun. I was actually speaking to a guy at the final shop I was in Rotterdam earlier this summer, and he did, yeah, he, he said that uh, Arna Slot was a cultural fit at Liverpool in terms of the city that he's come from in Rotterdam, mm -hmm. this kind of city that Liverpool is, was drawing lots of comparisons there. So um, certainly it does feel like if you get a few good results at the start of the season, the feeling around Anfield and Slot, um, could be really, really exciting. OK, let's move on to our final story. Um, a transfer that, that is, is as good as done as we're recording this may well be completely official by the time you're watching this. Conor Gallagher to Atletico Madrid, mm. Samu Omarodian to Chelsea. I mean, Chelsea have insisted that they are separate deals. We spoke about swap deals, but... The same fee going both ways. Slightly different fee, actually. Oh, slightly different so fee. Sorry, that, that, there's their out. There's their out. There's the out. So, Conor Gallagher's one. Um, that's agreed now between Chelsea and Atletico Madrid. We think it's around £36 million when you do the exchange. It'd be interesting to see how he fits in as well at Atletico Madrid because they, they have got quite a number of midfielders who Diego Simeone favours nearly every single week. And it'd be interesting to see if... Conor Gallagher is going to be able to get into that team. You know, we've been talking about the fact that Chelsea are effectively implying he'd be a squad player at Stamford Bridge had he stayed. I wonder if he's going to go from one squad player to being another squad mm. player. So I just want, definitely want to keep an eye on to see how much football he actually gets and who he displaces at Atletico Madrid. Meanwhile, Samu Omorodion coming from Atletico Madrid to Chelsea. That one is worth around £34.5 million, okay. so slightly less. So not, a straight, yeah, swap. not a straight swap. Um, they are, they're actually chasing him earlier on in the window. And I think there were a couple of other clubs who were interested in Omar Odeon as well. I think West Ham might have been looking at him too. But at the time, he was like had a, a loan spell at Alaves last season. I think he scored about eight goals in 34-odd appearances. I think he got out of the team towards the end of the season. It's still quite raw, but his feeling was, no, I'm coming back to Atletico Madrid. This is where I want to play, and this is where I want to develop. So there were, it looked like, on his side of it, no move was going to happen. I just think that Julian Alvarez has, this changed, complete, has changed the dynamic completely, mm. only because at the start of the window, Atletico Madrid probably didn't even think that they would be able to do a deal like Julian Alvarez from Manchester City. Now, even if they wanted to keep Omarodion, 
they're probably going to need to make some money because it's going to be an 82 million pound deal all in for Julian Alvarez. So hence why they had to decide, look, Omarodian, you can go. I know Morata's gone, but he was it was minimal money. Of course, yeah. the wages are going to come off the books as well. But um, Omarodi on that one looks like he's really, really close now. He's actually at the Olympic Games still, though. So he's with Spain in their gold medal match, I think, which is on Friday against France. And so once that's over, I think all of the medical and the finalising of the personal terms will be done and he will then become a Chelsea player. Fair enough. So, so a bit of a late squad addition there. Um, Enzo Maresca this week, interestingly, was blaming PSR rules for Chelsea's kind of conduct of selling academy stars in mm. the market we're, we're quite well versed in that now you know pure profit on the books mm. you know financially it, it makes a lot of sense in that way especially when Chelsea are you know spending have spent the kind of money that they have over the last few years he was saying it's a you know it's affected all Premier League clubs it's a Premier League problem not a Chelsea problem would you say you agree it's a Premier League everyone's yeah. been faced with it we, we knew that there was almost two deadlines this this summer, the, the August the 30th deadline, which is coming up. Mm -hmm. but there was also that June 30th yeah. deadline as well. And as much as clubs didn't publicly say, uh, uh, apart from Everton, I think, Everton actually did say that they might need to sell players before June the 30th to, to make sure they're in compliance. But the rest of the clubs, it's not in their interest to make it public that they are sailing close to the wind mm -hmm. for PSR. Because if you do that and you go into the market and say, we want to sell you this player, buying club what are you going to do you're going to say well i'm not going to pay you 30 million because you're desperate for the money here's 20 plus add-ons how about that uh, okay and then we yeah. saw these curious deals mm. shall we shall we call them before june the 30th that happened between a set number of clubs it felt like that um and, and between each other as well to generate this cash so i think enzo maresca does have a point I think that if you speak to Chelsea fans, specifically on the Gallagher deal, I don't think it's left a good taste because there's one thing saying, yes, it's PSR and he's going to generate pure profit. But then there's another thing saying when you're interviewing the manager, yes, he's a squad player, but then so is Moises Caicedo, so is Enzo Fernandez. They're all squad players. But the difference is they were given seven year contracts and you've offered Conor Gallagher two years plus one. It's a massive difference. If that doesn't say to the player, long term, we don't really see you here, then I don't think, I don't know what does. Yeah. The, all the noises were that Gallagher was happy to stay at Chelsea, but he wanted the kind of contract length that was in line with the other midfielders and what seems like every other player that comes to Chelsea in line with that. Omar Odion's going to get a seven year contract. Trevor Shalabar, who seems to be ostracised from the squad just now, he was given a seven-year contract. Conor Gallagher was given two plus one. Yeah. The message is, away you go. And it, it, it does feel like, a, I guess, a slap in the face, Lawrence, for a player who you know played more minutes than anyone else at Chelsea last year, captained them for much of the season in the, in the absence of Rhys James. You know, was yeah loved by the Chelsea fans, as you're saying, Darmesh. Um, what do you make of Chelsea's? Kind of, I guess, transfer policy, you know, un under Todd Burley and Clear Lake Capital, it's obviously puzzled, you know, a lot of onlookers over the last couple of years. But in particular, in the case of Gallagher, you know, yeah, what, what are your feelings on this? Well, we, we were speaking about the long term at every club. We were speaking mm. about the long term at Manchester United. I, I think until we've kind of seen the fruits of their labour, it's hard to judge it because there might be, there might be a smarter plan that maybe we're not privy to. Um, I don't know if on the surface it appears that way. I think when I read whatever the plan is and when I read the reporting around the plan, I always feel like it leaves one key element out, which I feel that other clubs maybe look at a little bit more. And that's the psychological side of the way you treat players, the way that players feel at a club and the feel and overall culture that you're looking to create in any sporting organisation. That's not to be underestimated. You know, the big pull of Man City is the culture that Pep has made there. Don't don't get it twisted here. It's like, you know, people are going there because they want to play for Pep Guardiola and they want to play in an incredible system. The same goes for Liverpool. The same goes for Arsenal. It doesn't seem as if that's the same at Chelsea. And so the, as much as it's left a bitter taste, I would say Conor Gallagher's kind of made the right decision for him in his career as well. And, you know, as much as you'd love to play for your boyhood club and you'd love to be in a place where you feel comfortable and you can raise a family, all those kind of things, 
you've also got to make the right decision for the long term for him. Um, but like you said, Namash, they didn't really leave it in his hands to make the decision. It was mm. kind of like, you're not really wanted here, so yeah. best, it's best you leave. The psychological impact of that, I think, will not only be lost on the players at Chelsea, but it also won't be lost on the people they want to sign. And there will be players looking at them thinking, do I ever want to be treated that way? So if your idea is we want to sign the best of the best, well, guess what? The best of the best want to be treated as well as the best the best deserve as well. There's a reason people go to Barcelona and Real Madrid and they want to play for these institutions because they treat their players really, really well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, although equally Barcelona have been questioned a little bit in terms of their treatment of players in the absolutely. last few years. But Sure, but, uh, but, but, but you get, you, the point yeah. still stands essentially. Before that, they treated the players really well. Yeah. Now there's, there's a reputation players, there. Yeah. And they've, they've ruined that reputation through the way they treated yeah, the yeah. players. There's a lot of like received knowledge, I think, in yeah. football, though, that very often we, we work from. Mm. And it's clear that Chelsea are not working from the same, the same received knowledge that everyone else is working mm. from. Obviously, you know, in American sports, the culture is very different. And, you know, depending on where you go, East Coast, West Coast, or, you know, whoever you want to support, they've created their own culture there. Chelsea starting the season without a kit sponsor, yet again. Chelsea are yet again starting the season not knowing whether certain positions are going to be filled. Maybe that feels a little bit more normal to mm. an American, uh, you know, operating. But it feels unusual in the UK where we want our club settled, where we care a bit more about the fans, those kind of things. That, I think, is very damaging to the Chelsea image. Yeah, interesting. I mean, any Chelsea fans watching this, let us know your thoughts in the comments. What do you make of the Conor Gallagher sale? What do you make of Chelsea's business this summer? How do you think Enzo Maresca is going to fare this season? Do you think we can see an improvement on Pochettino, who, of course ended last season so strongly before leaving. Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Before we finish the show, as always, we've got our Sky Mobile Switch of the Week, where each of us pick our favorite completed transfer from the week just gone. Darmesh, what's caught your eye this week? I mean, West Ham United uh, have been catching everyone's eye mm. with the business that they've done. And I think the high profile ones are obviously gonna be Nicholas Fulkrug and Chrysentio Somerville. But my Switch of the Week is the, the one that kind of went under the radar compared to the other two, which was Guido Rodriguez. He was a free agent after his contract had expired at Real Betis. And for all the money he was going to Barcelona, it was almost a done deal. But that deal broke down once Xavi left Barcelona. And so I think West Ham United like detected an opportunity here where no one else was actually going to go for him. Yeah, he's not a young man, but wealth of experience and we had Terry Gibson on the Transfer Talk podcast earlier on in the week who knows so much more about La Liga and Spanish football than, than I could ever dream of and he was saying this guy walked straight into the West Ham team. He said the role that Barcelona had for him and I know we say this about if it's a young left-sided player we say oh he's a new Messi but he was saying he could do what Sergio Busquets could do. So if he can come in and do half of what Sergio Busquets did at Barcelona for West Ham United for no money at all in a transfer fee and it's only a two-year contract plus a one-year option I think it will be a really really shrewd buy so that's my switch of the week. Yeah I like that as well um, yeah I mean won World Cups and well, has won a World Cup yeah. and, and Coppers America with with Argentina as well so amazing experience uh, uh, being brought into that West Ham side. Lawrence who have you gone for this week? Well just a uh just blame someone for letting go of someone who was a, a, a young prospect at their club, <laughs> a, a Emile Smith Rowe from mm. Arsenal to Fulham. I think you know it, it worked for all parties because he, he wants more consistent playing time and he wants to be able to show what he can do. And I think he's going to do that at Fulham. I mean, you saw it already in some of the pre-season games they've been playing. I think he had an impact within just a couple of minutes anyway. He's one of those players. He's like a bit like a player's player, I think it's worth saying. He's one of those guys that everyone in football wants to do well. And the fact that he could stay in the same city where he's been for quite some time, the fact that he could go to a club which seemed to welcome him with open arms, and the fact that he will get to play in his preferred position, all of those are going to be really great for him, really great for the national team as well, and really great for the Premier League, because I think it only improves the product when someone comes from such a big club and goes down the league a little bit, rather than having to go off to another big team in Europe. It makes the league stronger overall, and that's what I want to see is more entertaining football. And the reverse fixture that uh, next year is going to be really fun to watch. 
Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think, yeah, Smith Rowe, I think everyone kind of wishes him well absolutely. at Fulham, um, don't they? Um, and he'll certainly bring something a bit different um, to Craven Cottage. Um, just to finish off, I've gone for Artem Dovbik uh, to Roma from Girona. Um, I was trying to find another move in the Premier League, which, which caught my eye as much as this one. But I just think top scorer in La Liga last year, top scorer in Ukraine for two seasons running before he moved to Girona. Um, yeah, we all saw um, just how big an impact he had um, in Spain last year. Um, and to go to Roma for, I think, 30.5 million euros. He rejected Atletico Madrid as well, which just goes to show you know, how higher calibre this striker is. Um, I think it's really exciting for Roma and Daniel De Rossi's kind of rebuild um, at the club. So exciting times, I think, in Rome. But that's all we have time for on the transfer show for today. Darmesh, thanks for joining us. Hopefully we'll see you soon and good luck with the rest of the transfer window, Pleasure. if not. <laughs> uh, Lawrence as well, yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's been great to have you on. Uh, before we finish, remember that with all the transfers going on this summer, it's never been easier to switch to Sky Mobile. All you have to do is text PAC, P-A-C, that is, to 65705, 65705, and Sky Mobile will do the rest. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.